Welcome back to the Sheep and Goat webinar series. We're really excited this week. We get to uh, in, we get to welcome the University of Wyoming as our another co-host here, and we're really excited about this collaboration. So welcome, Wit, who is your uh, UW Extension Sheep Specialist. Um, I'm Melinda Ellison. I'm the UI Extension Sheep Specialist, and your other host. Um, your third host today is Carmen Wilmore, who is an extension educator for the University of Idaho in Lincoln County. Um, as we get rolling here, make sure that you follow us on one of the two or both Facebook pages, UI Sheep and Ghosts or UW Sheep. You can also follow and watch all of the webinars that we've done over the past few months and this one later as well on our YouTube channel, the University of Idaho Extension Livestock channel. Make sure to subscribe to that for more videos. And you can also follow us on our webpage. I would like to welcome today Phil Bass, who's our Extension Meat Specialist here in Idaho. And he is going to be visiting with you about how lamb and goat are positioned in the market today. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to come and, and share. Um, this is, this is it, it, was a, it was a pleasure to um, be able to, um, uh, to kind of actually look into an area that I don't spend an, as much time in. Um, I spend most of my time in the beef world, um, so full disclosure there. But um, it's, it's great to be able to um, branch out a little bit further and talk about something that is, is um, an area that I, I do like to talk about. Um, and I believe we're in a really good position right now to be having this discussion of lamb and goat or sheep in general um, and goat, um, especially from the meat side. And hopefully I'll give you some ideas as to um, why I believe that's important and why I think um, we're going to see some successes. And so that's, that's, that's why I said now is the time to have this discussion. Um, there's so many cool things dynamic wise that's happening in the business, in the meat industry in general, um, but then also um, just in society as a whole, especially in the United States and, and um, looking at some of the great ways that we can promote these, um, uh, promote sheep and goat meat um, at this time. So um, I think now is the time. So let's make sure we, we do get that information out there and share the successes, okay? So first we need to just talk about where, where are the sheep being produced? And um, forgive the numbers, uh, we don't have the goat numbers here. And I'll, we'll get into the goats towards the end of the discussion. Um, but uh, goat numbers are harder to get a hold of. And this is just the reality of things right now, um, production-wise and, and population-wise and harvesting and meat and everything. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. But I also believe that there's, we're going to see that change very, very quickly. Um, top sheep producing states in the country. Um, Idaho, um, here our, our home state, doesn't make it in the top five, but definitely in the top 10. Um, we're ranked number seven right now as far as population of sheep um, in the United States. And so definitely something that, that is important to our state. And for those of you tuning in from Idaho, um, that's not a surprise to you, I'm sure. That's, it, this is, a, the, we, ha, we have great grazing lands. We have the public lands that we can put animals out on. Um, and and um, it's just very well set up. That and also culturally with especially some of the Basque influence down in the south and such and so so sheep um, is, are, have definitely been a big part of um, the history of Idaho and, and the growth of animal livestock in Idaho okay but we do need to talk about some realities right now okay let's talk about meat production in general okay and I went back to quite a ways um, to 1983 meat production um, uh, and and looking at the different main species that are out there um, beef, the world that I spend probably the majority of my time in, we are starting to see a bit of an uptick in beef production. Um, pork over the last 20 years has had their gradual increase um, in sales and meat production. Um, poultry has had a much greater increase um, over time um, and continues to be a pretty strong dominating player in both the retail and in the food service world. And what we're finding actually is even bigger in the food service. Um, and, and, um, and, and so poultry just has a great price point, um, great protein um, opportunity. And then we do have our uh, other, uh, our, 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 our lamb and goat species. And, and, and um, the little tiny calf that you see down on the bottom of the screen, that's going to represent veal production. And so that's been historically something that's been produced um, in the United States quite a bit, but 
that continues to decrease quite rapidly. And I'll show you here a graph as we zoom in on that. And then of course our, our lamb production. Historically, guys, the reality is, is that lamb has taken a back seat for quite some time. Um, to give you the, the actual historic um, story as it goes, um, if, you, if, you, if, if anyone can recall, um, uh, the veterans coming back from the South Pacific um, after World War II were fed an awful lot of mutton that came out of Australia. Um, it was an inexpensive protein source and was, was available to them um, in that area and logistically it made sense. However, when they came back from fighting in the South Pacific, there was this, uh, this, this, this uh, reoccurring theme that anything that had anything to do with, with any meat that had anything to do with sheep, um, they just referenced it and, and recalled it as mutton. And, and the, the forage finished old mutton that was being fed to the troops at that time probably wasn't the most palatable. And as a result, um, it was excluded from uh, from the dinner table for generations now. And so we're still dealing with that effect but don't lose hope because I believe we have a lot of great potential, a lot of great things being set up for success right now, okay? So let's zoom in just a little bit into that uh, 1983 to 2020 um, timeline and look at the meat production um, with, re with regards to um, lamb in particular. And, and again, uh, I apologize, I don't have a lot for goat production. I'll show you some goat production here towards the very end, um, but we're only just starting to record that stuff in the USDA. And so, so bear with me on that. But as far as meat production, we're starting to see this leveling off period for lamb. And that's awesome. I believe what we're seeing is kind of this, this movement toward, uh, we, we do have the foodie population, especially um, the older millennial generation that um, graduated college, went out into the workforce, um, maybe have been removed from lamb at home and sheep meat at home. And forgive me, I use the term lamb because that's just the term that we use in the United States, but sheep meat in general. And now they're going out, they have money, they're trying different things. And they're, 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 they're trying these different flavors and boldness of flavor is a, big, is a big driving factor. And it's probably some of the reason why we continue to see a decrease in veal production. That's the pink line that you see there. Um, uh, veal, veal, that's a whole nother different topic for a whole nother day. But it is exciting to see the leveling off of, of meat production in regards to sheep um, compared to the dramatic decline that we continued to see all the way from the 1980s. Now, the amount of meat, sheep meat being produced, if we look at that as a per, per capita sense, it's really only about two lamb chops per person per year. So we need to increase that, but I think we can. I think if, if we all work together and we kind of look at the great attributes that lamb and sheep meat bring as far as a palatability trait, we can really come um, a long ways. And so I'm going to put this up here. And if this was kind of a broad open discussion or if we were having a discussion at a, in, a, in a conference setting um, or in a classroom setting, I would, I would sit and ponder this and ask, ask the group, what do these things have in common? Because they're quite quite different items, um, if, if, uh, if I would say so. We have uh, India Pale Ale, beer. We have Sriracha Doritos, and we have lamb. We have some lamb chops. And the thing that I would, so I will answer that, that rhetorical question, <clears throat> boldness, boldness of flavor, um, a stronger flavor. And there's no question that, I, be, I believe there's no question that the consuming public is looking for a little bit more flavor to things and, and differences in flavor and that boldness in flavor. If you go to, um, to a grocery store or, or your favorite beer store and you see um, the offerings that are there, I would say almost over half of the craft beers now are uh, India Pale Ales, IPAs. Okay, um, and, and if you're not familiar with that, that is definitely a much stronger flavored beer. Okay, and it's going to have a higher alcohol content. It's going to have a lot more bitters and a lot more hoppiness to it and a whole bunch of other flavors that come along with that. Sriracha Doritos. If a corn chip manufacturer goes all the way to the extent of flavoring their chips to the, the bold 
and and robust and stronger flavor of the Vietnamese hot sauce sriracha. Um, I think there's probably some something to that. I think there's some connection to the consumer. And those two big items right there lead me to say, I think lamb is very well set up for success because it's not to the extreme boldness as an India pale ale or, and it, and it doesn't, definitely isn't a spiciness like a sriracha, but it's a different flavor and it's a desirable flavor and it's pretty tasty, especially for those who already have a flavor preference for lamb um, or say something like dry aged beef, which is an area that, that, that here at the University of Idaho, we do conduct research on. And there's a reason for that because people are looking for those differences in flavor. And I think lamb doesn't have to hardly do anything to be able to provide that difference in flavor. Okay. And so we do have a consuming customer base already that already um, goes and, and, and desires the flavors that are there in lamb. And then we have this other customer base, which is much larger that maybe doesn't know about the great flavors that can come from lamb and goat meat. And we just need to make sure that we help them make that connection. And hopefully that's what we're going to do today is just give you, give you as land producers and, and, and sheep meat enthusiasts um, the, the, some, some tools in your toolbox to go help tell that story. Okay. The National Lamb Quality Audit that was conducted in 2016 looked at evaluating um, a lot of, of uh, what are those consumer preferences. And so talking to consumers who regularly purchase lamb, the number one reason they purchase lamb is taste. So what is taste? Well, it's flavor, it's tenderness, it's juiciness. Great thing about lamb is it's, it's, it's almost always tender. We're harvesting these animals in the United States at a much younger age. Now, when we get into mutton, that makes a little bit difference. And we'll talk about how those animals are graded and we can evaluate and, and actually add value or, or um, add a value proposition to those animals. Okay, but generally speaking, in the United States, we're consuming young lamb, okay? And so tenderness is not a problem. Juiciness, we don't necessarily always cook lamb to a very high degree of doneness, however it can. And so we need to make sure that we're looking at some of those quality grades that we'll talk about here in a little bit. But that flavor is always going to be tremendous in lamb. You're going to get a more robust um, forward fronting flavor that's going to be um, uh, very much more pronounced than many other um, uh, domesticated livestock species. Consumers who are accustomed to eating lamb or mutton with a particular flavor seem to prefer that flavor. And so this is actually something that's, that's um, it's, it's not that unusual to encounter that. Um, uh, it, there are re there's research out there that looks at certain populations, certain regions of not just in the, in the United States, but in the world where if there's a, a, a specific type of uh, raising practice that produces a, a unique flavor for those animals, the people that, are, that grow up around that kind of have a flavor for that and have a taste for that. Well, if there are those that are already consuming lamb or mutton, um, uh, they, they probably seek out and desire that particular flavor. But this is also that great opportunity to try to connect the other consumers who aren't regularly eating that um, to see if they maybe do prefer that flavor. Now, the challenge with that is we got to make sure that we match the right cut to the right consumer. And more research that's been conducted on lamb flavor and taste have found that the lamb leg is going to have most of that species specific flavor compounds in it. Now, if you think of some of your traditional um, uh, cultures that eat a lot of lamb, usually that leg is going to be kind of that main event for large holiday gatherings. Okay, so I'm, in my family, a very Italian family, we, we love to have that lamb leg, but it's also going to have a lot more of that robust flavor that comes with it. Whereas a lot of folks that may be just trying lamb will have a loin chop or a rack chop, a rib chop. Um, and that's going to be in an area that maybe doesn't have quite as much of those flavor compounds, those unique lamb specific flavor compounds. And so it's gonna be a more subtle flavor, but over time that may become something that becomes very desirable to them, okay? So we need to first off, try to just get folks trying the product, but at that same time, 
we need to probably encourage them to use certain parts of that animal just to get their feet wet, just to get them trying and, and seeing um, a, a more gradual flavor evaluation of the meat, okay? And then, of course, mutton will have a lot more of those intense flavors, okay? So different cuts for just different consumers. We got a big job ahead of us, but it's okay. I think we can do this, all right? Now, beyond just the meat itself that's going to bring flavor, um, there's also a lot of great complementing flavors. And, and so, so let's just talk about this first. So we have the complementing flavors that are very common to Southern Europe, um, to Eastern Mediterranean, um, uh, uh, Middle Eastern cuisine, um, and then also even kind of in the French cuisine area where you have your wine reductions. But, but if you think of this, a lot of these have a lot of aromatics to them. A lot of flavors that are just going to be coming out and being very bold flavors in, them, in their own right, those, those ingredients that you combine with lamb. But lamb and goat bring that boldness of flavor that complements these stronger aromatics. Okay? You can't just go and put a red wine reduction sauce on a chicken breast. That's not going to turn out well. All you're going to taste is the sauce. But with lamb, you can still get that lamb flavor or the goat flavor coming through and working very well with those more aromatic and, and complex spice mixes, okay? And I, and, and, and I say that, especially with that last bullet point that's in front of you, the Indian or curry example, okay? Um, some research um, a few years ago um, looked at, was, was looking at, at um, uh, the dining um, experience and different flavors that were up and coming and, and different cuisines that were up and coming um, to the greater um, food service population, to the, restaurant, um, uh, to the restaurant scene. And if we think about, uh, if, if, if you go over and you say, where do you want to go for, where do you want to go for dinner? You want to, you want to get a steak? You want, you want a hamburger or Italian or Mexican? I mean, that's kind of our main cuisine choices in the United States. Now, I'm oversimplifying things, obviously, but those are our kind of main staple items. And what that's saying is that Mexican food is, is just as popular as a hamburger, and Italian is just as popular as a steak, and sometimes you go to an Italian steakhouse. So we have these, these main foundational cuisines in, in the United States but one that's really was kind of right on that edge, that cusp a couple years ago, and I think it's starting to cross over, is that Indian, that, that, that Indo, that, that Southern, um, uh, uh, um, that South, South, Southern Asian continent um, cuisine, the Middle Eastern cuisine, um, that Far Eastern Mediterranean cuisine. Some of these places that really have a complex spice palette but they're starting to really become this up and coming cuisine that's available to dining customers. And it really complements well with lamb and goat. Um, beyond that, we have, of course, our Caribbean cuisines that complement well. And again, we're talking about strong spice palettes and possibly even, a, even, even some spicy, like as in hot flavors. But you can't, you, it won't necessarily overpower the flavor that's naturally in lamb and goat. And so, um, so, so, so there's, there's some, some cool different um, ingredient directions that we can go that's just going to really bring out and, and make that meat itself shine, okay? How do we get the meat itself to shine in its own right, though? And that's where we're going to look at some grading factors. Grading, so there's two, there's two types of grading that's available through USDA, yield grading and quality grading. Yield grading, um, I'm not going to spend any time on that, but really it's, it's looking at how much meat um, do you get from that lamb carcass versus bone and fat, okay? Um, uh, what I want to talk about is the palatability side, and what is the expecting eating, what is the expected eating potential um, of, that, uh, of that meat, okay? Just the meat itself. Two main grades pop out. We have USDA Prime and USDA Choice. Um, now, there is a USDA Good, and I'll mention that here just very briefly, but it would be almost similar if you're familiar with the beef grades um, to a USDA Select and the beef grade. 
and, and historically select actually was good in the beef grades. But really the grades, if you, if you see a grade at all in lamb, it's gonna be USDA primary or USDA choice, okay? Now, um, I, I won't mention any names, but if, for those of you who know you, me um, well enough, know who I'm talking about, but for my PhD work, uh, my major professor kind of joked and said, well, I could probably grade just about all of the lambs in this country um, without leaving my office. And he jokes because um, most of those animals, over 95% will be a USDA choice grade. The remainder, almost all of the remainder will be USDA prime. I'll show you kind of the evaluation of lamb carcasses and I'll, I'll mention kind of some of the obstacles and maybe hurdles we need to overcome to add even more value to these carcasses. But that's the reality, okay? Um, as as uh, James Nosados, our, our meat lab manager here at Vandalbrand Meats at the University of Idaho jokes, he says it takes a pretty poor lamb carcass to be good. So, um, and I'll show you an example of that here in just a moment, all right? But really, USDA Prime, USDA Choice. Let me, let's talk about what makes it, what, what makes for um, that value proposition, which leads to the overall eating experience. Okay, all right, so here's the factors that we would look at for grading a lamb carcass. Carcass conformation, maturity, and lean quality. Okay, the, what, what is the quality of the meat itself, the red stuff, okay? Now, carcass conformation is going to going to come into play um, as as uh, finish on the animal and muscling on the animal. Here, let's show, let's just show you that finish and muscling on the animal. Um, but it's a very subjective evaluation, and really, the majority of the evaluation of the lamb quality grade will be made on the maturity and on the lean quality side. Okay, so I'll, I'll show you that. But here's just some examples of the lamb confirmation. And as I, as I mentioned, how, how our meat lab manager says it takes a pretty poor lamb carcass to be good. Okay, um, which means most animals, most lamb that are going through federally inspected uh, processing that also are eligible for federal grading um, will be finished to an extent that it's not a hot, it's not hard, it's not difficult for them to be choice or prime, USDA choice or prime, okay? Um, you're just not going to send a, a lamb to market that's going to be in the good category um, or less than that, which there's something called utility, but that's for another discussion for another day, okay? So really we're looking at these animals more towards the left-hand side of the screen and we're looking at animals that just have sufficient muscling, good fat cover over them, um, and that may be indicative of the overall quality. So what do we look for when we're talking about the overall quality? And I mentioned the maturity. So how do we evaluate the maturity of these animals? If you look at the top um, left-hand corner, the example of the cannon bone, the metacarpal bone on these carcasses is left on. And that's going to be one of our primary indicators as to the maturity of these animals, how old they are. Um, as animals mature, the cartilage in certain areas, especially the growth area, the growth plate areas, turns to bone, what we call ossific ossifies or ossification, literally turns to bone, okay? And so in a younger animal, on the end of that, that, that metacarpal bone, if it's cut into uh, around the, the, uh, the um, collagen, the connective tissue around it, you should be able to break through that growth plate, which should just be cartilage at that time. And that's, that's indication of a younger animal. However, as they mature, that growth plate starts to fuse more. You get more ossification or calcification. And then it's harder to break that. And that's what you get, the spool joint. And if you look at the, the, that, that right-hand image on the top left-hand corner, um, you can see um, the spool joint. And let me see if I can use my pointer. Can, can you guys see my arrow moving around? Yep. Yep, okay, good. So here, here's the, here is the spool joint. And this is getting harder and harder to describe to um, students coming through the university because very few of them have ever done any sewing and so don't quite understand what a spool may look like. But this is a spool joint right here. Um, now, now, of course, with our current um, unusual situation in, in society, maybe more people are at home doing a little bit of sewing and learning some of those different um, trades. But here's our spool joint. And that's, 
that's that's the leftover or or that's what's left on when you cut around um, at the end of that cannon bone, cut around through the collagen and the connective tissue, the the, the tendons that are holding everything, and you break o open that the end of that hoof or you pull that hoof off uh, on the carcass, um, and you have that that spool, that nice smooth spool. If it's a younger animal, you have that break joint, okay, and you can actually kind of see. Um, some of that ossified area that was bro broken down, okay? Um, the other thing that we look for, and it's not, so it's not just the break joint, and if you have one break joint, it's still considered lamb, okay? So you can still consider that in the younger um, animal category. If you have two spool joints on that um, carcass, now it goes into the mutton category, and so it's quite a bit of a discount um, if you're selling that through a traditional commercial um, large-scale packer who's doing grading. Okay. Um, we also look at lean maturity though. And another indicator of an advanced maturity of these animals is that the, the red meat itself gets darker in color. And so you can kind of see some images there as well that shows kind of a progression of increased darkening of the lean um, in, the, uh, in, the, in, in the animal's cavity, in, in, the, in the thoracic cavity and abdominal cavity. Okay, so we're looking for that lighter color, um, red, bright cherry red color uh, on the lamb lean, and we're looking for break joints, not necessarily spool joints. So if we have the younger animal, lighter color lean, we have, a, we have a much younger animal, and that's likely going to produce a very tender product, okay? But how about the quality, for the, more, the other parts of palatability, right? The other parts of taste, which is juiciness and flavor. Well, a lot of that comes into um, the amount of types of fat that we can encounter. Now, when we talk about, um, uh, talk about quality grading in more of the beef side, we're looking at the ribeye and we have a big muscle that we can evaluate and we're looking for marbling, okay? Well, we can't necessarily do that on all these lambs. Number one, that's not how we cut lambs, okay? We cut lambs in a different, in, in a different manner. Lamb carcasses are usually left entirely whole until right immediately prior to fabrication. And so the industry has looked at a way of evaluating lamb carcasses by evaluating the what's called flank streaking or the streaks of fat that's in the lean. And so you can kind of see um, this gradual increase in the amount of fat in the flanks, in the flank area right here, um, as you get to a, an animal that is increasing in, in uh, eating quality potential. That is going to be the somewhat equivalent to marbling in a steak that you would see in a beef steak, okay? And so that's going to give us somewhat of an indication as to the flavor and juiciness that's going to come because the fat is going to produce those species specific flavor compounds. And the fat also helps to maintain a juiciness when you cook those steaks, especially if there are those who prefer steaks, chops, cutlets um, to a higher degree of doneness, um, having that extra fat that intramuscular fat in the meat will help to maintain that juiciness and flavor, okay? So if you combine the maturity and the flank streaking, you can see um, you can get into those, those prime choice good categories. So we need a younger animal um, that also um, uh, has a higher, uh, a, a sufficient amount of flank streaking to result um, in those higher quality grades. Again, the overwhelming majority of lambs going through, um, uh, going through um, uh, commercial packing facilities, they're going to be in the choice grade, and then the remainder is pretty much prime. Um, animals that, uh, that are underfinished generally aren't even going to the processor yet. Okay? So that's talking about the larger scale um, uh, uh, lamb production industry, um, but kind of some ways that we can evaluate these carcasses for overall eating potential and quality, okay? Once we have the carcass itself, here's some of the different cuts that you can encounter. And these, this is the area where we can really start to help the consuming public identify and almost design an eating experience for them. I know that kind of sounds crazy, but um, I, I love visiting with chefs and, and talking because they're the ones that are really, they're, they're tuned in to what the consuming public likes. Now, we're, we're, we're seeing this huge movement of product through retail, especially right now, considering the unusual situations we're dealing with. But we can't forget just how close of a relationship um, the restaurant community has to the dining customer and to, to the consuming public. And they're the ones that can get that regular day-to-day -day feedback. And so I like to ask them and talk to them about what, is the, what are the things that, that 
that um, the dining customer likes um, because that will ultimately relate to how they purchase meat at a retail outlet as well, okay? And that's where I like talking about, let's design an eating experience for the dining customer. Because some folks maybe don't realize some of the different cuts that are available on the lamb carcass. Now, traditionally, again, during the holiday season, certain cultures, certain groups will gravitate toward the leg. Um, it's a nice big roast. It's a great um, example of, of just, um, it, you know, it's, it, it's beautiful when it's sitting there on a platter. Um, tastes great, feeds a lot of people. Okay. Um, not a huge expense when you, when you compare that to, say, a rack of lamb or a, or, or a loin roast or something like that. Okay. So, um, so it, it, it's a great value that way. And then it's also very traditional. But what about the ones that are just, but what about the consumers that are just starting to dabble in trying new things and trying lamb and trying goat meat, which is going to be the same cuts essentially? Well, we probably want them to be trying the rib chop or the loin chop because it's going to be a much more subtle flavor, as I've already mentioned. Um, but it's also something that's just going to be more available to the restaurants, okay? Um, so, so, it's, 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 um, uh, so, so we need to encourage those restaurants to, um, uh, to, to, to um, talk about the, the more subtle flavors, but it's still going to be a more robust flavor that they can get out of those rib chops and loin chops. Something that we don't talk about very often, and I would love to see more of it, are the shoulder chops. So arm chops, blade chops. Um, actually, those are, <laughs> personally, those are my preferenced um, flavors because they have, they have um, not quite as lamby flavor, the, 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 the uh, stronger flavors that may be more undesirable to those who, who can't, who, who have a threshold of boldness of flavor, um, but it still has a great flavor to it. It's going to have a sufficient amount of fat to get that juiciness. Um, it's going to be substantially lower cost than your traditional rib chops and loin chops, um, and, and usually still has a pretty darn good tenderness to them. Um, and so things that we could talk about to the restaurant community and maybe trying to hit certain price points, because that's often going to be a barrier trying to get people to try more lamb, um, is, is that it is a more expensive product to begin with. The yield isn't as great um, as, as beef and pork. Um, the, uh, the, ava the availability isn't necessarily as great. It's kind of a catch-22 there. But we do need to continue to try to drive the idea and design a dining experience for these, these end users and just give those ideas of, well, if you don't want to necessarily spend the $8.99 a pound or higher on a rib chop, maybe try a shoulder chop, like a blade chop or an arm chop. Um, and those are going to give you a great eating experience um, for almost half the price of something like that. And then beyond that, um, the, the more group style dining, the lamb breast, um, that's one that, that I think is overlooked quite a bit too. Now it's going to have a lot more lamb flavor to it because of the amounts of fat, the subcutaneous fat that's over the top of that. But it does lend itself towards a really cool presentation where you can cut right between the sternum bone um, and, and essentially the brisket muscle open that up, make a pocket, uh, and you can put a kind of a stuffing in there, and it uh, just makes an amazing presentation, really cool. The shank um, continues to be a uh, sought-after item um, in, in the food service, but we need to, I think, encourage more of that at the retail outlet because, you know, people are starting to really uh, better understand, I firmly believe better understand braising and slow cooking, especially with the, the advent of the Instapot, um, as, as we um, at my house call it the magic kettle. But the Instapot, if you're not familiar with that, it's kind of a, a speeded up slow cooker. Um, it's a pressure cooker, essentially. It's going to help break down the connective tissue in those shanks, but still provide that great eating experience at a, at a, in a quicker time than your traditional slow cooker would. Slightly different um, uh, uh, cooking technique to it, but, um, but still um, uh, great opportunities to just get more lamb out there, more goat out there for, for folks to enjoy. Now, if you're interested in more um, data and, and would like to talk, uh, like to evaluate more of just what's a, what's a good price for these items? Say, so if we have producers who are on the line right now who um, are selling more um, uh, uh, 
smaller um, amounts through say farmers markets or if you're if you're trying to factor and figure the cost of your freezer lamb that you're selling to a customer um, locally, a direct to consumer kind of situation. Well, USDA does have um, pricing for lamb cuts. Um, now this can be kind of hit or miss at times because there's only a few large scale um, uh, USDA uh, packing facilities and packing companies in the United States for lamb. And as a result, um, sometimes there's not enough volume in certain cuts or even in carcasses um, being sold um, with a, enough variety of, of uh, packing base um, to allow for that reporting to be done at the USDA level. Okay, but in generally, you can get some good information. And so if you go to the USDA AMS, that's Agricultural Marketing Services, um, AMS um, website, um, ams.usda.gov, you can look at market news. You just, it's, it's pretty simple. You just click it on, on the meat, on the lamb, and it'll, it can give you some of those other um, options. This particular report, this is a weekly report that's put out um, in a PDF form. The graphs may change. Um, week to week, but it's still pretty relevant information. It just gives you some good ideas to think about when you are trying to design and, and put pencil to paper, figure out what is the cost um, that's associated or what is the value that I can ask for um, for these, um, for these the, maybe my freezer lamb that I'm selling direct to consumers, okay, for those who are, are, are looking at that type of marketing opportunity. Um, for, for the others that are out there, maybe just want to see, um, so the larger scale lamb producers who are selling directly to a large scale um, uh, packing house, uh, maybe you just want to see where's the market sitting right now? What should I expect for these animals? What kind of return on my investment should I be getting back on these, on these critters? Um, what is the volume of lambs going through, the, through um, the harvest facilities right now? This report can help you out with that. Okay, so, so just try to give you some resources that you can go back on um, to evaluate this. And if you ever need to, please reach out to us at the University of Idaho um, Extension Service through Melinda, through Carmen, um, through myself as well. Okay, and we can get you this information later on. All right. So how about we talk a little bit uh, about the elephant in the room? And I've mentioned it a couple of times, the unusual circumstances that we're dealing with right now across the world, um, the COVID situation. I guess I, I try to be an eternal optimist. I'm definitely not always the case, um, but I try to be optimistic. And I believe this is actually setting up meat in general for great success. Um, but I also especially believe that this is setting up lamb and goat for great success, okay? And the reason for that is that we actually have real live um, uh, data guys, from, re, from the retail sector that shows that people are trying lamb. We're seeing this increase in fresh lamb sales that's happening. Um, and and any, any number above that line means that it's an increase in retail sales, okay, um, compared to the, to the baseline index. Now, um, if you look at the light blue line, that's our lamb line, you can see that we had a huge increase in, at, uh, right, right at the, um, the Easter time. Um, that, that was Easter, of course, but we continue to see just an increase in retail sales, which I would imagine historically, I need to go back and look, but historically this number should have remained rather flat. Now, with any market, when you see a huge uptick, you're often going to see a huge downtick. And so um, with the most recent data, data that I have in front of you, that's why you see that, that, that lower, that drop off in the following week um, of lamb. But guys, this, is setting, this, this whole scenario is setting up retail lamb, t lamb sales for success because if you've been following any of the news, beef has been uh, the top um, discussion. There's no beef. There's ground beef is $6 a pound. We can't afford it anymore. And honestly, you're probably better off buying a ribeye steak right now than you are trying to buy ground beef. But if there's an insufficient amount of beef that's out there or pork that's out there or chicken that's out there, people are going to look for alternatives. Now, I wanted to start and title this discussion, Lamb, the Other Red Meat, um, but I, I went away from that, mostly because um, pork, the other white meat, for those of you who are old enough to remember that slogan, um, actually kind of backfired on the pork business. Um, so I didn't want to call it that. But I also 
believe wholeheartedly that this has now become an alternative to your regular beef consumers who are going to the grocery store, not finding beef or not finding out the value that they want. And they're looking elsewhere. They're looking at, at some of this other red meat that might be pretty good and let's give it a try kind of thing. And so we are seeing these, these, these increased retail sales um, in lamb and that's pretty darn cool. Um, this is just reported retail sales, which means it's all through USDA inspected product. Um, I would imagine those who are doing direct to consumer sales, um, going through custom harvesters, selling a live animal to the, to, to the consumer, then what they do is just have it processed through a custom shop and then they take all the meat. It's not for sale technically. Um, I would bet that that business is up as well, just based on some of the, the, the discussions that I've been having with others in the meat business, large and small, and then also some of my um, extension colleagues. A um, lot, lot of opportunity right now um, to, to, um, to, to capitalize on kind of the um, curiousness of consumers. People are cooking at home, guys. This is exciting. Um, and, and um, you know, I, I, I have seen a trend, especially with the kind of older section of the millennial generation for more cooking at home. They're getting pretty good at it. They like it. It's fun. They do it as a group. But now we have this, this captive audience. We got to really capitalize on it and get, get these folks out there trying these new things. Okay. So that's lamb. What about goats? So I don't know if you can see my screen very well um, uh, of, of, of my images um, or anybody who knows me, um, but yes, uh, the basses, we have perfected cloning. Um, that is my, that's my little boy, Vincent, and that's his goat, brownie goat, who will be sold at the Lataw County Fair later this year. So anybody who's interested, please stop by. Um, but uh, brownie goat uh, is kind of one of those, those uh, he's a great example of kind of this big sur surge in, um, in goat excitement and, and, and raising goats more on a small scale because goats don't have the big impact that maybe a steer would. Um, and they're kind of this area that's maybe is, it's definitely growing in competitiveness, but it's not quite as competitive as say maybe the club lamb area. And so we're starting to get this younger generation that's looking at goat as a viable livestock in, uh, enterprise. Um, and hopefully that will continue to grow in years to come. Okay. So that's just on, on, on the 4-H scale, but how about on the greater uh, goat scale? As I mentioned, Goat data is hard to get a hold of right now. We just don't have very many of these animals going through. So if we're looking at um, a few million head of, of uh, sheep being harvested in this country uh, every year, we're looking at just over half a million goats. Um, uh, on a week-to-week -week basis, um, goat... Um, uh, uh, goats being harvested under federal inspection is, is about it's less than one quarter of what sheep are right now. And so um, it's a pretty small amount, but again, that's under federal inspection. Okay. And that's the numbers that we have to work with. That's the reported numbers. This is not necessarily accounting for goats being harvested on farm or goats being harvested in a custom outfit. And that's, that's probably where we actually probably see a lot of these animals going through. Um, now, it's probably still not to the, to the extent that you see here on your screen, but we are seeing a bit of an uptick, okay, in recent years. And I believe that's going to continue to grow quite tremendously. Now, the reality is, is that, um, as I've mentioned, this isn't probably all of the goats being harvested in the United States right now. And we have to realize that we do have um, some communities and some um, some cultures that are very comfortable harvesting small animals at their own, at their own farms, at their own, at, at home, essentially. And so um, goats can, can uh, be one that's, that's easily harvested at home. Um, not a lot of uh, excess uh, paunch and hide that you got to get rid of compared to say a steer. Um, you don't need a scalder. So you, so that's, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, a hog or a, or a chicken or something. Um, and so, pretty easy to work through and especially anybody that's has experience um uh, uh dressing a deer it's going to be very similar
okay? And sim simple enough to break down as well. And so I believe we'll continue to see an uptick in actual goat um, meat harvest um, on the federal side, and hopefully we continue to see it on the custom side. Now, something else that we need to look into, and I actually looked for empirical data on this, but it was hard to find, but there's a reality of a large groups of, of immigrants from certain areas that really put value on goat meat. Um, goat can be harvested under halal inspection. It can be harvested under, under um, kosher inspection um, or, or kosher um, certification. Um, and halal, for those who are unfamiliar, halal is, is um, for traditional um, uh, practicing Muslims. Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of their version of kosher. It's not quite as strict, um, but still something um, that uh, has relig religious um, connotations to that. But that goat meat, um, it is one that's, that's more desirable to certain populations. And we do have a large group of um, Northeast African descent and Middle Eastern descent that are coming to North America, a lot in Canada and in Northern states in the United States. And with their traditions, goat meat tends to be um, uh, something that, that's on their dinner table. And so in large metropolitan areas, we're actually seeing quite a bit of goat being um, sold. Um, and that's probably where these federally inspected numbers are coming from. And I believe we're going to continue to see an increase in that as well. And so hopefully um, we'll, we'll, we'll get more, uh, more momentum in, in that category. And we'll have more data to show with you um, uh, uh, maybe next year or, or later on. Okay, so as far as USDA is concerned, though, really not much of a grading system that's out there. Um, it would be great to develop one, have one developed. It would probably come along similar lines as the lamb system, the lamb grading system. However, um, goats don't tend to put as much fat down, um, subcutaneous fat, and, and, and likely um, quite probably not as much um, uh, uh, flank streaking fat. And so that would be a hard one to evaluate. So um, there's more research to be done in that category. Really, the way the goat is merchandised based off of USDA qualifications is um, gender. So buck, doe, weather. Um, in the maturity category, so you have a kid goat that's less than um, 14 months old, a yearling goat, 14 to 24 months old, and then a goat goat um, that's, that's two years old. Um, you can have breed types, and this does make a big difference as far as the carcass conformation is concerned. Your dairy type goats will have a much more slender body to them. Um, you don't need a necessarily a big muscular uh, milking goat, um, uh, and that's where certain different species, uh, or uh, not different species, but different breeds of goats um, can really lend themselves more towards um, the different uh, directions as far as uh, uh, agricultural production. Different forage types. Um, now, goats, I, I also think, are, are going to continue to have this growth because we're looking at ways of controlling and mitigating um, brush and forest fires. And goats are an amazing uh, means of doing that because they're great climbers, um, they're great foragers, and, and there are a lot of folks that are out there that are, that are having, you know, their herds of goats that go out and help with brush control and fire mitigation. Well, once those animals reach a certain size, they're great for also marketing the meat as well. Um, but depending on the type of finish you have on those animals will result in a different flavor likely. Um, the feeds can influence the flavors. And so if an animal is finished predominantly on forage, say they've, they've been out eating dry grass somewhere, that's gonna result in a yellower fat um, that's going to probably have a bit more of a grassy flavor to it. And it's probably, not probably, most often that grassy flavor is, is less desirable. Now there are con customers that are out there that actually prefer that flavor, but in blind samplings, oftentimes it's not necessarily the case. Okay, so if we could get, say, a, either a forage finished animal and go down that marketing route, or we look at more of a kind of a blended concentrate and forage or, or, or a traditional concentrate finished animal, um, different marketing opportunities there. Okay. And then, of course, the slaughter method, you have kosher, which is, uh, is the most strict, halal, which is, it, it does have um, certain um, criteria that need to be met, but not quite as strict as the kosher slaughter, um, and then conventional slaughter. And so um, different slaughter methods will result in different overall value that's assigned to those carcasses. So 
Um, that's so, so that's the USDA side of things. Um, uh, not as much on the goat side. Hopefully I'll, I've given you some things to think about though, and, and some ideas, um, and, um, giving you a few tools to go out there and just spread the good word of sheep and goat meat. And, um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and give you my contact information, but, uh, are there any questions that, uh, that I can answer while we're on the line? Yep, you've got a few. Cool. Uh, the first one is, in a way to get people who don't usually eat lamb, I try, sorry, <laughs> in a way to get people who don't usually eat lamb to try more lamb, I'd like to make gourmet lamb sausage. Um, I think that a lot of people are not experienced at cooking and sausage is a good way to pre-flavor and introduce them to lamb, but I have a hard time finding recipes or even anyone that can help me develop recipes. Do you have any resources for this? Yeah, um, well, I, I wish I had more resources for it. So, um, so, so lamb, especially because of the more robust flavors that are in there, um, you're going to need to trim quite a bit of the fat away um, unless you're trying to get more of that intense lamb flavor and then you can just incorporate more of that, of course. Um, uh, I would look at, as I mentioned, some of the um, some of the uh, Mediterranean flavors that I've that I've talked about, southern Southern uh, European, Eastern Mediterranean flavors, um, incorporate things like that. Um, the merguez sausage is probably the most popular lamb style that's available um, commercially, um, and that's going to be north 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 African, Southern European kind of uh, flavors that come with it. Um, you could you could look at at maybe um, uh, including red wines into that. You always have to be careful including wines into a sausage because the bind changes because you're you're going to be lowering the pH and the meat doesn't want to stick together as well. Um, and then also it's going to come down to if you're wanting to specifically target a certain customer base, say one that is both conventional but then also say a halal um, uh, or kosher, you're going to need to use lamb casing for that. Um, which are going to be much smaller than your traditional sausage casing sizes, um, uh, but they are they are certainly a lot more expensive too. And so um, either either lamb uh, natural lamb casing or there's also collagen casing that's available. It's usually made out of beef collagen that would suffice for those different um, uh, religious um, criteria. Um, Outside of, uh, uh, of uh, product development, um, that's, that's a bigger discussion for another time probably. Um, but um, yeah, just, just keep looking and, um, uh, and, and um, yeah, I, it, look, look in areas that, that are large consuming um, uh, lamb and goat consuming populations. So that North African, uh, Southern Mediterranean or so, Southern uh, European, um, uh, Eastern Mediterranean and, and just see what kind of recipes they have in whole muscle form and try to develop that in, in the sausage side. So good question. Okay. Um, I'm going to let Gary ask his question. He's raising a hand. Hello. Yep. Hi there. Hi. Uh, I raise mainly goats. Uh, I was wondering, do you see the market turning from imported goats to uh, uh, domestic produced goats? Boy, that's a great question, and I'm going to have to go and research that one and get back to you. Um, I. I, I, with the amount of information that's the very little amount of information that's available just with domestic product, um, uh, I didn't even bother to look in the imported goat, um, but uh, I'm, I'm sure it's out there somewhere and I'd have to look. Um, I, I would say with the popularity of goats starting to be raised more and more in the United States that there's probably going to be a bit of a, a tide turn if there is a lot of imported goat happening right now. But I, I don't know if I could give you an, a, a, a very firm answer on that, so. Okay, fair. Yep. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Okay. Uh, we had a comment about, you know, small farmers encouraged to do direct sales, but in a lot of areas, it's really hard to find USDA inspected 
uh, slaughterhouses, do you have any suggestions about how, if you're trying to sell individual cuts rather than whole or half lamb, what people might do when that's a challenge for them? Yeah, that's that's a tough one. And, and so you can try to sell individual cuts, but, uh, and I realize you can get more um, uh, per, more, more dollars per unit by doing it that way. But um, my, my biggest encouragement would be for you to have somebody just buy the entire animal. And I know that's harder to do, um, uh, but uh, you, you're going to need to have them buy the whole animal and run it through a custom shop if the USDA opportunity isn't there. If it is, um, but it's just harder to get scheduled or get, get timing wise, um, uh, m most folks that are that are, are regularly purchasing lamb understand that it's going to be a higher cost anyway. And so um, you're just going to have to pass some of that along um, the production cost and the, and the fabrication costs and things like that. Um, so, so yeah, that is, a, that's definitely going to be a tough hurdle that's out there. I really encourage folks to sell them more as like freezer lamb and uh, sell the live animal, live animal to the end user. Um, and then, um, and then have it run through a custom shop that are going to be more available in those situations. Okay. Uh, so this is a comment just for all of us panelists. Uh, goat meat is more mild than lamb. It would be nice to see a larger emphasis from our land grant institutions on growing and marketing goat meat. So that's just something that we can keep in mind. Um, we have a question about what your favorite way to cook lamb is? Oh yeah. Uh, so, um, gosh, I, I I I remember mom sending me to college with a uh, um, a a ice chest full of lamb um, that we harvested at home, um, and um, I, I being a, a son of an Italian family, uh, I, I will confess my sins to you all and um, tell you I didn't do a lot of cooking growing up. Um, uh, my mother is, still is an amazing cook, and I wasn't going to get in the way by any means. But the advice she gave me um, is um, rosemary, garlic, and lemon juice, um, and salt and pepper, of course. Salt and pepper is just, that's, that's a no-brainer. Um, it's kind of the, the universal seasoning. Um, but a little bit of salt and pepper, um, lemon juice, rosemary, and garlic. Um, and, and as she said, you can never put too much garlic in there. Um, and, and again, the great thing about lamb is that it, it just, it's, it's hard to overpower the lamb flavor. And so um, if you do like garlic, um, it complements very well. And that's the way I prefer it. I agree. I'm with you on that. Uh, the last question that I have so far is, uh, this person didn't know that the neck of lamb was uh, cut. And so mm -hmm. can you expand on how much lamb comes from the neck and what you would use it for? Oh, uh, so yield on the carcass is probably two to three percent, so it's not much. Um, and what they've been merchandised as is uh, something called uh, neck slices. Um, <laughs> doesn't sound super palatable, I'm sure, but um, that's that's what it is, um, and it's it's essentially a chop. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's one at the top of my list of, of lamb cuts. And I would say most um, lamb neck is just simply going to be boned out and used for stew or fajita meat or something like that. And that's the way I would actually encourage most folks. Um, the, it, takes a, it takes a special person to really go and say, gosh, I really am hankering for a, a neck slice right now. And so um, uh, for merchandising purposes, I would encourage folks to have that just deboned. Um, and make fajita meat or lamb stew or something out of it. So first and foremost, thank you so much for joining us, Phil. It was really good information. And I think we're going to hopefully have you back for some uh, different topics because cool. you're always fun to listen to and get information from. So um, next week, we are going to have Tom Murphy. Uh, he's going to be talking about estimated breeding values for enhanced lamb and wool production. And as we're gearing up to purchase bucks and breeding season, uh, the next few topics that we're gonna have is gonna be related to that. And with that, myself and my two other hosts would like to thank you for uh, being on this week and for continuing to support our programming. And again, thanks so much to WIT for coming on and 
um, making this a collaborative between Idaho and Wyoming. So we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you.